Milton de Peyrac Perrin and Palmer and Delonfor. Good to see you both. Been years. Downloadable content is a mixed bag to say the very, very least. Some DLC can grow a game massively, adding on entire new regions and quest lines, characters, mechanics, and systems. And some of it, let's be honest, seems like little more than a scheme to make a quick buck. One of the most notorious examples, of course, is Horse Armor for the Elder Scrolls Oblivion, a piece of DLC that cost around $2.50 and allowed you to stick different sets of armor on your horse. It was scandalous at the time, with many people unable to comprehend how Bethesda could justify charging for something so small and, well, silly. Since then though, there have been some bits of DLC so ludicrous they've actually made us look back on the equine armour with real fondness. So without any further ado, here are seven bits of DLC that made horse armour look like a bargain. Number one, pretty much everything about Evolve. Before it launched, Evolved seemed like a really exciting game. Four players would squad up and take very different specific roles as they hunted down a hideous monster. Said monster would be controlled by a fifth player who would attempt to remain hidden as they consumed AI prey animals in order to evolve into a stronger adversary before stalking the other four players and tearing them limb from limb. With some very positive previews floating about online, Evolve looked set to be pretty great. Then the pre-order and DLC plans were announced and people started to suspect Evolve's gouging wasn't just limited to its monster attacks. A swathe of DLC was planned for Evolve from day one, meaning the game had three different pre-order versions. You could get the base game, the Digital Deluxe Edition, which included all the content in the Evolve Hunting Season Pass at a slightly lower price than buying both separately, or the PC Monster Race Edition, which included all that, plus a few extras. The Evolve Hunting Season Pass included the fifth playable monster, two new playable hunters, and a few monster skins if you were wondering. Oh, and if you pre-ordered Evolve, you'd get the Monster Expansion Pack, including the Behemoth Monster Type, which you could also buy for $15, if you wanted. Feeling a bit overwhelmed? So was everyone else when all this was first announced, and what's more, they weren't happy about it. Developer Turtle Rock Studio spoke out about the controversy, making the argument that the game content was locked two or three months before the game actually shipped, this being what developers refer to as going gold, and that they would have included the extra stuff on the disc if it had been ready in time. Of course, the implicit end to that sentence, but it wasn't so we decided to sell it to you, did not sit well with consumers, and the DLC controversy dog Devolve well after its launch. It was so infamous and so damaging to the game, in fact, that it went free to play the following year. Although by that point, I feel the horse had already bolted. Downloadable armor and all. Yes. <clears throat> but hey, while Evolve may have come with a monster load of DLC, at least all of it was truly downloadable content, rather than stuff that was, say, locked away on the disc, which is exactly what we got with Street Fighter Cross Tekken. In March 2012, a video emerged showing the Xbox 360 version of Street Fighter Cross Tekken. The only thing was, the footage included characters that were, at the time, exclusive to the PS Vita version of the game. This alerted users to the fact Capcom had put this content on the disc and then deliberately locked it away to be accessed as paid DLC further down the line. And unsurprisingly, this made a lot of people very angry. What was surprising, however, was what Capcom said to defend itself over the controversial move. Namely, there is effectively no distinction between the DLC being locked behind the disc and available for unlocking at a later date, or being available through a full download at a later date, other than delivery mechanism. A statement that makes some kind of sense, but even now doesn't seem entirely fair. Because sure, if something isn't ready to be implemented in a game by the time that game goes gold, then a publisher might decide to sell it as DLC once it is ready. A mercenary move, but not entirely unexpected. If it's ready so early on that it can be put onto the disc, however, then it's reasonable for a consumer to expect this content would form part of the main game and not be sold separately. But hey, at least Capcom wasn't selling DLC for a game it hadn't even finished yet, as happened in the case of Ark Survival Evolved. <laughs> Ark Survival Evolved came to Steam Early Access in June of 2015. 
In September 2016, it was still in early access, which is why so many people were surprised to be offered paid DLC called the Ark Scorched Earth Expansion Pack. The pack brought a whole new map to Ark, pitting players against an arid wasteland. It also added 12 new creatures, more than 50 new items, and a new boss. The expansion launched for 20 US dollars, but quite rightly players immediately started asking why it was being sold to them at all, when the base game hadn't even left early access yet. I mean, the whole idea about a game launching in early access is that players pay for the game, thereby supporting its development, and in turn they get to tinker with it and see for themselves how it changes as new stuff gets added, right? You're not really supposed to take that new stuff and decide that actually you're going to sell it instead. It's especially hard in this instance to argue the developer wasn't purposefully taking something out of the main game and denying it to their core players unless they were willing to stump up some cash, because, well, the main game simply wasn't finished yet. If we're talking about taking something out of the main game and selling it back to players though, we really need to talk about Dead Rising 4. Aside from killing hordes of zombies, one of the mainstays of the franchise has always been the timer. From the very first Dead Rising, you've always had a certain amount of time to get everything done before the game ends. In the first one, for instance, this was just 72 hours. Rather conspicuously, however, this timer was completely absent from Dead Rising 4. Well, not completely absent, the Frank Rising DLC added it back in, if you care to stump up some cash for the privilege. Unsurprisingly, fans weren't best pleased. While some people hated the timer, lots of people felt the time pressure was what made Dead Rising what it was as a series, so they were pretty hacked off to discover they'd need to pay if they wanted to experience it that way. Now, it may seem like I'm focusing on DLC from Capcom a lot in this list, but to be fair, Capcom does make it pretty easy. Case in point, our next game is Azura's Wrath. <laughs> Azura's Wrath was a brilliantly off-the-wall game released back in 2012. In it, demigod Azura aims to get his revenge on all the other demigods, who, of course, betrayed him. He does this, naturally, by beating the snot out of each and every one of them, including a wonderful and utterly bonkers boss battle in which he fights an enormous fingertip as it seeks to squish him like some furious, spiky-haired insect. With such a bombastic story, it's not really surprising to learn fans of Azura's Wrath were pretty pissed off when they discovered the true ending was locked away in a DLC pack called Nirvana. See, getting an S rank on all the levels in the base game of Azura's Wrath will earn you a galling cliffhanger ending, and the only way to properly conclude the story is to get the Nirvana DLC, which adds four more chapters. With a launch price of roughly $7, it wasn't the most expensive DLC out there, but it was certainly one of the more controversial ones. But hey, not all DLC has to be about taking something and locking it behind a paywall. Sometimes it can be about making things more accessible, and then making people pay for them, which is exactly what happened with Mortal Kombat X. Fight. If, like me, you grew up playing Mortal Kombat, you'll know the series' iconic fatalities have always been very gory and a little bit fiddly. I remember writing the inputs down in the game manual for Mortal Kombat on the Super Nintendo as a kid, and even now Scorpion's up-up block fatality input is burned into my memory. Seemingly, not everyone has such fond recollections, however, as simpler inputs for fatalities have long been requested by members of the Mortal Kombat community. Finally, for Mortal Kombat X, NetherRealms listened, adding in easy fatalities for the low-low price of 79p for 5 or £3.99 for 30 just stop and have a think about that for a minute. Simplified button inputs for existing in-game moves were put behind a paywall. Seems a bit daft when you think about it really, doesn't it? Feels a bit needlessly mercenary slash really disappointing, on balance. We're almost at the finish line in this little downloadable dalliance, so really it's quite remarkable to think we've got all this way without mentioning Day One DLC, perhaps the most hated type of downloadable content going. Mass Effect 3's From Ashes DLC is probably the most notorious example, with lots of fans decidedly unhappy that EA and Bioware were pushing paid add-on content the moment the game was available. EA and BioWare addressed the controversy, saying they'd used the gap between the game going gold and releasing to start work on the DLC, and while having that time to work on downloadable content makes a certain kind of sense, having it ready on day one still felt like a bit of a money grab to fans. 
they'd have been better off giving themselves more time and avoiding the controversy altogether, to be honest. Unfortunately, the situation wasn't improved by PC players realising at least some of the files for the DLC were available in the base game, and indeed that parts of the DLC could be unlocked just by changing a couple of values in the code. BioWare was again forced to defend itself, saying the only way the new DLC character could be inserted seamlessly into the core campaign was by having certain framework elements and character models on the disc. Apparently, this is something they did with Mass Effect 2 as well, and to be honest, I'm no developer, but it certainly ticked off a few Mass Effect fans, before they finished the game and got really angry about the ending instead, that is. So there you have it, seven DLCs that made Oblivion's horse armour look like a bargain. After that, I think we can all agree the topic of DLC is a hot mess, really. Some of it can be great and can genuinely, meaningfully extend the life of a game for those who want more without being completely ripped off, and that is great. A lot of it, however, gets it very, very wrong and ends up alienating the player base. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, we've got plenty more for you to watch. Some of them should be on screen now, so do give them a click if you fancy. Do like and subscribe for plenty more from Eurogamer, thank you very much for watching, and have a lovely day.